Okay. Um, I put these pictures in here. This is a picture of my dog, Jax. And then I put this photo in because I recently came across it. This was 12, 18 years ago. And I had my first camera in my hand, which is an Olympus Epic Stylus. So I never knew that I would work for Olympus, but, but there it is. Um, always supporting Olympus. Um, this, these are some of the styles of artwork that I do. I have a lot of stuff like this. Um, so just to begin on food photography. Um, I've kind of categorized it into four different categories. I'm sure that there are many subcategories and people might categorize this differently. But the, the way that I've categorized this is how I view things on how easy versus hard things are. So the way that I see it is fruits and veggies and anything uncooked tends to be a lot easier to get a good photo with. Um, I have theories on why, but, um, and I don't know, I've never really discussed that with anybody, so I'm, I'd be curious to know what other people think too. Um, baked goods, I think, are also easy to photograph. Um, the harder things are like pastas and casseroles, like cooked food. I struggle with getting a good photo of that. I think it has all, all to do with lighting, but, um, and then restaurant food. Depending on the lighting, it's that's usually where um, the struggle comes in because a restaurant typically has like good mood lighting, but it's not good for uh, taking photos. So depends on the lighting. Uh, so that being said, lighting is the most important element in my opinion, and that goes for a lot of photography. So I'm not saying that you have to have any kind of special equipment, although I think that certain cameras or certain phones might have more limitations, but you can still get a good photo with any image maker. So um, for this presentation, I'm mostly going to talk about window light because it is the most abundant and it's the most available for everybody, at least for right now. Um, so window light. Um, outdoor sunlight if you have the ability to go outside on a porch or patio. Um, the other option would be artificial light like an LED panel or softbox so so long as it's the softbox is used to diffuse the light. Um, softboxes it doesn't also have to be anything fancy like you don't currently have one although I know you can do curbside pickup if you wanted to really get into this um, but you could also use white, uh, anything white, because it reflects light, so like sheets or something like that. Um, and then speed lights can be used in food photography. I actually have a friend who does a lot of food photography with speed lights, um, but I think that that is a very advanced way because when you're using constant light, you see what the light is going to look like in real time and with the speed light just with anything unless you're just really into speed lights um you see the light after the fact so if you know how to shape that kind of light then go for it and then overhead i have marked out because i think it casts bad shadows for most types of photography um let's see so the larger your light source the softer light's going to be and that goes for also any kind of photography um, and it will it will definitely be more diffused and create fewer shadows that way. Sometimes shadows are, are what we want, but you can change your angle and manipulate the light to, to work for you. But gen as a general rule, um, the larger the light source, the softer the light is going to be. Here's an example of just using window light. Um, I, I forgot I wanted to mention on this one. I've put this photo up here because this is the window light that I was using. Um, it's not necessarily like the greatest photo, but I wanted to show you like this is the light that was coming in. So I was using, I was putting my back up against the window basically and shooting into the home instead of shooting at the window because that's going to create a lot of weird things, I guess. Um, but this is one example that it did work for, I guess because the window was smaller or, or there wasn't nearly as much light coming in and it didn't create crazy shadows. But it also created a lot of really soft light just naturally because it was coming through the window indirectly. Um, some alternatives to just using window light if you have the capability is to go out on a covered porch 
um, because it's still gonna diffuse some light that way. Use an LED light. Um, I would suggest making sure that your white balance is matched to whatever the LED light is. And if you don't have the capability to match it exactly in Kelvin, then um, use your uh, custom white balance. That will help a lot and to get the right color temperature on your, on your, um, on your photo. Um, and then again, you can use white things like white sheets of paper, poster board to reflect light back. So white is always reflected, or light is already always reflected from white. And um, so one kind of technique that we're all probably very familiar with is creating a shallow depth of field. Um, this is, it just really depends on how you want to portray your photo. But I think it's interesting to have an array of either a very shallow depth of field or a, a larger depth of field. In this case, the strawberry has a very shallow depth of field. And if you look on the cutting board, you can also see exactly where that plane of focus is, which is kind of an interesting way to look at it. Um, but to create a, a shallow depth of field, you would, there's different ways to do it. The most common way um, that people know is to open up your aperture to a wide aperture, like 1.8, f2, 2.8. And that just naturally makes the lens have a shallow depth of field so that everything is blurry in the background. Um, you can also achieve it by backing up and using a zoom lens to zoom in. Um, that creates a more blurry background. Um, you could also use portrait mode if your phone or if your camera has that ability. It tends to blur out the background. Um, and one of the most important things in creating a shallow depth of field, even if you have, let's say you have a standard 50 millimeter 1.8 on your camera, um, the amount of distance between you and the subject and the subject in the background has a lot to do with how blurry that background looks. So um, you can kind of play with that. If you have a lot of distance in between the subject and the background, you're likely to have more of a blur in the background versus um, if, you, if your subject is all the way on the background. And then macro lenses naturally have a more shallow depth of field because of the way that they're built. So that's something that you could use. On the other side of it, you can, um, you, you can close down your aperture so that you have a greater depth of field like f8 or f11 if light allows. If you're using one of light or if you're outside on a porch, then generally you're going to have the capability to do that because the sun is so bright. But if not, you could always put your camera on a tripod and um, slow your shutter speed down. So long as like food is probably not going to be moving generally. So um, you could slow your shutter speed down and not have a blur that way. And then wider lenses tend to have a greater depth of field also like a like a super wide angle lens although it's going to change the way that your image looks because it's going to be a wider field of view um one technique you can use and this goes for things also other than food photography is to use the like rule of odds in in design any kind of design or decorating or art Odd numbers just are more aesthetically pleasing to the human eye. Um, generally, it's the number three that's the magic number, but that goes for other numbers also. Like if, if you had five or seven, that also works better than four or eight, something like that. It's just a, I should study the psychology behind that. I don't know exactly why, but I just know it's a thing. Um, and things like this, like strawberries or peppers or a lot of produce actually, um, there's a feature in some of our cameras called high-res shot mode. Some of them have handheld high-res shot mode. Um, and that's a great way to use these or to great feature to use on things like this because you can zoom in and have so much detail. You can see things that your eyes normally can't see, which fascinates me. Um, there's a little bit more on that in this presentation, um, which is specific to Olympus but I, I won't spend a whole lot of time on that. Oh, here it is, the higher shot mode. Um, you can see so much detail in things like this. I 
can't actually see my screen with this. Um, so there's two different modes in, in different cameras. So beginning with the EM5 um, models and up, the EM5, you have a tripod only mode. And then in the EM, EM1X and the EM1 Mark III, you have a handheld high res shot mode. And the difference is there is in the handheld high res shot mode, you can actually hand hold a high res shot. So it takes a 50 megapixel file that way. And it takes 16 different images and it moves the sensor half a pixel shift and puts them all together for you. And on the on the tripod mode, it takes eight images and puts them together for you. Half a pixel shift also. And the, the way to get there in our cameras is to, to go to the super control panel, um, click the icon that generally you would go to burst mode and it looks like um, this right here, the little two squares with a bunch of squares in the middle. Um, if you hit info there, you can switch between high res shot handheld and then the tripod. Um, another thing that I think makes food photography very interesting or elements that you can add there are to play with textures. So if you just look around your house and you find different kinds of textures, like um, the, for this particular shot, I was at my mom's house and she has a thing for cutting boards. She loves to have different cutting boards from different um, you know, states and things like that. So I had a lot of different textures to play with there, um, but I liked using that and the honey. So there's glass and there's metal. There's a bunch of different elements right here. Um, there's lots of different things that you can add. Um, you can also play with the um, composition rules. The most common that we know is the rule of thirds. So in this photo, you can see that the honey and the honey stick is in the top left quadrant. And these are different examples of finding texture around the house um, with this kind of weave looking ottoman the metal texture, the shadows, the wooden floor, and then um, over on the right, there's a bunch of textures also with the wood and the lines and the patterns. Those are things that I just like in photography in general, but there's a lot of different mixtures and textures here. Um, using a macro lens can add some kind of interesting elements to your photography. This is just a a butter lettuce leaf with a very, very shallow depth of field. Um, I like it because I like abstract photography. That's not for everybody, but I like the curves and the shadows and the highlights that come through here. Um, and lettuce is often something that a lot of people have in their fridge or at least some sort of green like that. And so another thing that we have in our Olympus cameras is focus bracketing and stacking. Our cameras do this for you, so long as you turn it on and you use it. Focus bracketing, though, is something that can be done with really any camera. You just have to change your plane of focus. So what it does in camera is it it allows you, so you would focus on the foreground, the element in the foreground, and when you have bracketing turned on and press the button down, the shutter button down, and it will continue to take images and moving the plane of focus backward. And whenever you stack them, it will put those images together for you. So you would have the bracketed images and the, the stacked image. Um, you can choose to turn stacking on or off if you wanna bracket them yourself in, in other programs. But it's a pretty cool feature. And I guess one other thing to mention, if a lot of people do ask me this, if you're shooting in RAW, um, when you're bracketing, and you choose to have it stack for you, the stacked image is a JPEG, but you would still have all of the raw images in the bracketed portion. So I realize this is not a food image, but this is an example of focus stacking. So this is a stacked image in camera. And just to give you an idea, and hopefully you can see this um, on your computer, because they're kind of small, but you can look through these. These are all of the, the different bracketed images. Um, like on the second one here on the top, you can see that the stem is very out of focus. Um, and then the one to the right is more in focus. So it, it, it takes different planes of focus. And um, the final image, if you do choose to stack in camera, is, is cropped in a little bit 
because I did this all handheld too, because our stabilization is so good that you can do it handheld. Um, you would probably, uh, it, a tripod is recommended, but I, I guess I was being stubborn and I didn't want to put it on a tripod. So, um, but it's a really cool feature. And like I said, you don't have to have an Olympus camera to do that, um, to do the bracketing you would to, if you wanted the camera to stack it for you. But these are the equipment that can, can do it so far. It doesn't work with every single one of our lenses, but most of, both of our macros and a lot of our pro lenses works with. Some other tips is to, uh, for food photography is to create your own um, pattern. You can, um, so I created an, um, an element with five little uh, rows here. And then I used different contrasting textures here. And um, I changed my settings so that the background was really dark. Um, I kind of did that on, on purpose, but um, other elements that you can add that, that add some interest, I think that you can add more texture and you can add more um, color is if you used a dish towel or a spoon or some sort of utensil, just to give it a little bit more um, interest in the photo. And um, aerial shots are something that I often see in food photography. I am very aware that I broke the rule here with the, um, the rule of odds because there's six lettuce leaves there. But I also was kind of going for some symmetry and it's broken up into three rows, I guess. So there's, there's the odds there. But um, I would say if you're doing an aerial shot to um, get, the, get lines relatively straight, um, or if you're going to do diagonal lines, then make it, make it obvious. Um, if you're using a round plate, um, you could either center it very specifically and deliberately, or you could even cut off part of the, like a plate or a bowl if you have other elements in the shot too. You can just play with it and see what works. Um, you can also create your own angles depending on, or cre yeah, create your, own, create your own leading lines by using angles. So if you move your camera around and your, yourself around, you can find these different angles. So what I saw here was kind of like a V in um, the image. And then I use the cheese to kind of give some, some upward moving lines. And they're really subtle things that you can add in um, as, so, as long as you're paying attention um, to these different kinds of elements that you can add in yourself. Reflections are one of my favorite things in photography. Um, in any kind of photography, so especially with food. So I will admit that this is kind of a happy accident. I put salad in the glass and then later I realized how it reflected on the edges and I really liked it. But I do uh, really like reflection and anything. So there are a lot of things that reflect that you wouldn't necessarily even think of, like a granite countertop will often reflect if you're looking at it at the right angle. Um, glass, obviously metal so if you have an aluminum bowl or some sort of metallic bowl or plate those can create um reflections that are that add a really cool element to your photo um and obviously mirrors reflect you could you could add i mean maybe you could make that cool somehow bringing a mirror into food photography i i'm sure it can be done um yeah, and I just mentioned here that the reflection was the secondary thing that your eyes see because it was the secondary thing for me to notice whenever I took the photo, but I liked it. And it was just a very straightforward aerial shot and relatively straight lines. I can see now that I can adjust that a little bit, but I'm not gonna be too picky. So here's just an example of um, metal elements. So this was just a simple um, metal colander here and some cranberries. I would say, um, that this isn't the greatest photo ever taken um, and I put it in here mainly because I liked the different textures and you could see the water reflecting on it too. The only thing I don't necessarily like about it is the um, 
the way that the sunlight is kind of shot like shadowed on one part of it but I took this as a very nostalgic picture. It means something to me that would probably, you would probably never guess. I was at a friend's grandmother's house and she had just rinsed these cranberries and it was just a good memory. So that's what photography is about, right? Nostalgia in a lot of ways. So here's an example of a metal bowl that I have. It's just a simple um, gold reflective bowl and I put berries in it and I think that it creates a really cool um, reflective background. So the main thing that you see in the foreground are the berries, the blackberries, and I think those are called gooseberries. I think I've never eaten them. But, um, berries are also really interesting for the high res shot mode. They're really fun to be able to zoom in and see all of the intricacies of our food. Um, if you do want to play with reflections, one thing that you can do is put um, food on acrylic or plexiglass or something reflective. That's what this is, is um, acrylic. I think it's black acrylic. And what we did is um, had glycerin and water mixed in a spray bottle and we sprayed the fruit with it. And the reason I was taught this, um, you use glycerin in for food photography if you want it to look wet like this is because it doesn't drip off nearly as quickly so you can get the shot. So just a little tip on editing. Um, what I try to do, so in this photo you can see that the light was definitely coming from the right side of the photo which meant it left the left side and a little bit of a, a shadow. Um, there are probably other things that I could have done to, to fix that, but I just did it in post-processing instead of retaking the photo with a reflector or something. Um, what I do for things like this is I, um, I lighten the shadows and then I darken the blacks, which sounds like it might be the same thing, but it's not. Um, you can, by lightening the shadows, you increase some detail, but then you still can make the dark parts really dark. Um, and then another thing, an editing tip that I like to talk about is instead of using saturation, to use vibrance if it's an option. Um, I know I know it's an option in Photoshop, um, and it's even an option in Photoshop Express on your phone, which as far as I know was a free app, um, I don't know if it has changed since I downloaded it, but um, by adding vibrance as opposed to saturation, it just adds a little bit more natural color to it, makes the colors pop without increasing false colors. And I think that it increases the right colors most of the time. Um, I think um, on these, I didn't have to really increase a lot of vibrance because the strawberries we're already pretty vibrant, but um, it's a good tip for photo editing. Um, if it's possible to create some, some sort of action in food photography, I recommend it because um, it just kind of adds a little bit of fun and excitement to it. This was really easy to do because honey doesn't um, move very quickly and um, it kind of brings the viewer into the scene, I guess, because you can probably almost taste the honey. Um, it's also, I think, a good way to get other people involved, like your family or your kids. Um, this would be a good opportunity if you're home with your kids to kind of teach them and bring them into photography and create some sort of movement. So this could have been um, much more dramatically done, like with the sprinkles, but I, when I, I remember this from a shot, a shoot that I did a while back, and um, I just thought that that would be fun for kids to be able to show motion in photography with um, sprinkles or something like that if you're making cookies. So, so yeah, and um, if you do want to look at more resources, some more advanced resources than what I've given you here, there's um, a blog, Yes More Please. This is actually a food blog, but my friend here is the, um, the photographer. It's a husband and wife duo, 
um, that I knew in, or that I know in Austin. Um, also really great recipes. So um, I would recommend looking at that. I know that he, um, whenever I have, I had asked him before a while ago, like what his main tip is for food photography, because he does such a beautiful job in photographing food. And he said, I mean, he did say it's all about light and it's all about changing your angle and getting the right, the right angle and view. Um, you know, from taking a photo on the left might look completely different from the photo on the right and just playing with it and having patience. And that's what we have right now. We have time to be patient. Um, and then another resource for the photo bracketing and stacking is Peter Baumgarten, Creative Island Photo. He has a blog that tells you a little bit more about how to do the focus bracketing and stacking. And, and yeah, thank you. And remember to shop local. <laughs> and that is, that's all I have for my presentation. Thanks, Shelley. That was awesome. I'm kind of hungry now. Good thing it's dinner time soon. <laughs> <laughs>